All right, welcome to Freedom's Light Discipleship Training. Um, we're walking with Paul down the Roman road, and the book of Romans is called the book of Romans because he wrote the book to the church in Rome uh, while he was uh, in Corinth, just as a little background. And um, so I'm going to show you some things that the Lord has been showing me as I've been studying this. And uh, many of us, probably most of us, are waiting on the Lord to intervene in our situations. And most of us are doing this based on our goodness, right? And, uh, or based on our works, or based on our do instead of our who. Uh, but in truth, that, that's totally false. And in truth, he's already won the victory. And uh, just like he told the woman uh, last week that I told you about the woman with the uh, lung cancer. And um, he said, when I sat up in the tomb, he said, you sat up. And when I walked out of the tomb, he said, he asked her, did, did I have lung cancer when I walked out of the tomb? So this is the case that Paul is making. And so we're going to take a look at this in Galatians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, and see what it says. So in the King James, I'm going to read it in the King James, and I'm going to read it in the Amplified just to give us some clarification. So uh, Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 11 in the King James says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. All right, so now let's look at it in the Amplified. And it says, Now it is evident that no person is justified, declared righteous, and brought into right standing with God through the law. So we should... Paul is saying, don't you see? It's evident. You can't be justified by the law. For the scripture says, the just, the righteous, the people in right standing with God, shall live by and out of faith. And he who through and by faith is declared righteous and in right standing with God shall live. So the law will kill you, but living by faith will resurrect you, so to speak. All right, in uh, verse 12, but the law does not rest on faith. It, in other words, it does not require faith. It had nothing to do with faith, for it itself says, he who does them, the things prescribed by the law, shall live by them, and not by faith. So you're going to either live by the law, or you're going to live by faith. And then verse 13, Christ purchased our freedom, redeeming us from the curse, the doom of the law, and its condemnation by himself becoming a curse for us, for it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, is crucified. All right, now let's look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. In the King James it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And let's look at it in the Amplified. It says, Therefore, beware, brethren, take care, lest there be any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart, which refuses to cleave to, trust in, and rely on him, leading you to turn away and desert or stand aloof from the living God. And one more, and then we'll expound. And then in uh, verse 19, it says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And in the Amplified, it says, so we see that they were not able to enter into his rest because of their unwillingness to adhere to and trust in and rely on God. So their unbelief had shut them out. Now, I hope that you really got the gist of these scriptures, that it is so clear that he puts it within every single human being to know him. And he calls you to know him. Because why? Because he loves you. And, um, and he wants you to um, love him back. And he wants you to uh, cleave to him and to trust him. All right? 
But what happens is, and this is what we just read, that our own evil hearts, our own selfish desires, we just refuse uh, to cleave to him and to trust him. And then what happens? Well, then we are led away by our lust. That's what the Bible says. We're led away by our evil lust, away from the true and living God. And then we, then we will never know rest for our weary souls and our spirits. Because why? Because then we're separated from God. And, uh, and so what I'm telling you and what Paul is saying, it's up to you. It's your choice. And you, every single one of us, has to choose. And we need to choose right. <clears throat> and we need to choose rest. Now let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. <clears throat> it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And the Amplified says, Take care, lest there be any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart which refuses to cleave to, trust in, and rely on him leading you to turn away and desert or stand aloof from the living God. Now, how many people do you know just like this? We all do, right? And uh, how many people do you know that actually got saved, that got born again, and then turned back because they couldn't get victory over sin? See, there's a difference between backsliding, okay? You, you know, you get caught up in something, you know, uh, and, and like, you know, a pig to the trough, you, you know, turn back and go back to the trough of whatever you knew. But you haven't denied God. See, there's a difference. So if you backslide and you go back to something, you know, you formerly were free of, okay, but you have not renounced God, that's backsliding. All right. But a reprobate is somebody who's, back, who's actually said, forget it. I don't want you. You know, I, you didn't deliver me, so I don't want anything to do with you. All right. So do you know anybody like that? Well, Jeff, Jeff and I do. And uh, they were people that uh, we were, we were in the Navy with. And he lived with them, and he got saved uh, in their house, or, you know, while he was living with them. And they all kind of got saved at the same time. But... Um, the woman, her family, she was Catholic. Well, they were both Catholic. And her family gave her such grief, okay, over being born again and not being Catholic anymore that over a period of time, she literally renounced everything and went back to the Catholic Church. And, uh, and it is so evident. I mean, if you try to talk to her about salvation or anything about the Lord, I mean, she's just, mm -mm, she won't have anything to do with it. It's the church, the church, the church, you know. And so... So you can, um, you know, literally go back and say, no, I don't want it, okay? So uh, how about the ones uh, that, that just won't get saved, all right? How many of those do you know? <laughs> okay, well, let's say I count on all my fingers and toes, all right? And I don't understand that. Why do you not want to walk in the rest and peace that comes with, with knowing Christ? But they don't. They don't want to get saved. Okay, and sometimes people don't want to get saved because, well, they, they think it is all about works. And so they think they're not good enough. Or, or they think that they're going to have to change. And they don't want to change. Okay, so it could be all kinds of uh, different things that they think. Uh, but, and just like the uh, man who told us that we wanted to pray for him for healing, and uh, he was on disability, and he told us no, not to pray for him. He didn't want to be healed. Why? Because he didn't want to lose his disability. So you don't know where people are, okay? They're all over the spectrum. And, uh, but I would think most of it is um, either uh, just pure selfishness or, um, or a lack of knowledge and ignorance. But anyway, how about the example of the Israelites in the wilderness that we learned so much from? See, they saw all these astounding, uh, life-saving miracles, and yet they refused to believe. All right, And they had a wicked, unbelieving heart, just like Paul was talking about. They refused to cleave to, to trust in, and to rely on Jehovah God that they could visibly see. He was there. He was there in a pillar of cloud by day, covering them from the sun so they weren't out there getting in the desert being sunburned. And then at night, he was there in a pillar of fire. Now, And yet they still wouldn't believe. I mean, to me, this is absolutely astounding. And he constantly showed them his love and care for them at every turn. 
but all because of their wicked hearts. It prevented them from going into the promised land. Not one of them got to go into the promised land, except for uh, Joshua and Caleb. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So I recently had to repent of my own wicked heart and my own unbelieving heart. And God spoke to me something. God spoke to me about something two years ago, and I went back on believing it. All right. Now I never denied what He told me. I never denied the fact that He told me something. But what I did was I used logic and reason to go back and and you and use the logic and reason to to make an excuse for why it hadn't come to pass when I thought it uh, should have. So, um, so I actually came to a place where I thought, well, yes, this is God's will, but there's that nasty, that, that could be a nasty word. It could be a good word. <laughs> okay. In this case, it was a nasty word. All right. But so I was, so I, the, what the Lord showed me was that I was in essence calling him a liar. And so I had to repent and I did. And, uh, it's, and what he told me still hasn't happened. And, uh, but I'm back, but I'm back in faith. And I'm calling in the spirit uh, for it to take place. Now, what I mean by that is that I bound the demonic spirits that may have been holding it back, okay, for two years. And I'm releasing the spirit of God to go forth. And this is what Jesus told us to do. He said to talk to the mountain and tell it in my name to be cast into the sea. So that's what I did. And so I said, Lord, you do. I said, I said, Satan, you be gone in Jesus' name. And, uh, and, and in Jesus' name, you know, this thing come and this thing happen. And then also he says for, for us, to, he says if we will resist the devil, he will flee from us. And that's something that he showed me in this uh, Salmonella thing, that I did not resist it. I didn't come against it. I, I just embraced it. And like Jeff said, well, when you're in that much pain and stuff, it's hard to... Yes, it is. It's really hard to get your mind off of pain and the horribleness of the whatever you got. But the Lord showed me that that's what I should have done. I should have taken authority over it right then and there and, uh, and got, kept my mind on the Lord and, and proclaimed healing instead of giving into it. And um, anyway, but so he says that we are to resist. If we resist the devil, he will flee from us. And, um, and so... So I feel like that applies in this situation. So I do know what God's will is because he told me what his will was. And so it's silly for me to pray, oh, God, you know, bring this to pass when I know what, what his will is. He's already told me what his will is. So you see the difference? So, so now in, instead of saying, oh, God, you know, make this come true, well, he's already done it because he's already told me that that's what's going to happen. And so what he wants me to do is to realize that is his will to stay in faith, resist the devil. Every time he comes and tells me, oh, well, this is, you know, it didn't happen because of this. It's not going to happen because of that, blah, blah, blah. No, that my job is to resist the enemy. All right. And then my job is to call for, uh, for the, to, to bind those demonic spirits that are hindering and to uh, call forth you know, what I want, what God told me is supposed to happen, just like Jesus said to speak to the mountain. He didn't say, talk to the, talk to me about the mountain. He said, talk to the mountain about me. <laughs> All right. So, so how many do you know that have gotten saved, but are still struggling with sin and, and then maybe eventually walked away? Well, why is that? Why do people do that? Why didn't God deliver them? Why do people die? Why do people, why do Christians get sick and die? When Jesus said he has healed us. They don't resist the <clears throat> devil. And it's because they don't understand that Jesus already overcame the world. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the sin in the world. Now you can't overcome it. But he says, I've overcome it. And he says, on the cross, and, I, and I, I thought, I was reading a devotion this morning about the uh, brazen altar. And it said it had, you know, we've heard it has the four corners. And it says it was made of stone, and it had four 
posts or pillars or something. And of course, when I think of an altar, I think of something like this. You know what I mean? They're, the altars were as big as this room. I mean, you know, and they, they were gigantuous. And I uh, had a ramp going up to it. And uh, anyway, those four corners, and I had never thought of this, that the animal was tied to the four corners. And I'm going to do some more research on that, why they did that. Um, because I thought you slayed the animal and then, then you, you know, burned it. But, uh, so I got to do some research on that, um, why it was, so now I think, well, some of the, some of the sacrifices, this is just my thought, some of the sacrifices must have been alive and that's why they tied them to the altar, but I got to do some research on that. So if anybody knows, let me know. But anyway, my point is that, uh, interestingly, that four corners of the altar represented the uh, sacrifice going out to all the earth, all the north, south, east, and west. And then I thought about the cross. Well, the cross has four corners. It's got four points. And then I thought, how cool is that? I never thought of that, that the cross is showing that God, Christ died for everybody and his love goes to north, south, east, and west. How, I mean, it points to north, south, east, and west. How cool is that? I mean, it's just when you find little things like that, it's just astounding. Anyway, so what Jesus was saying was on the cross, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. And, and, and of course, at the resurrection, had he not been resurrected, well, then, then no, nothing would have been, would, would have been done. But um, what he's been showing me is that I've been doing it all wrong. All right? And so I've been, doing, I've been asking him for things that he's already done. <laughs> okay, and uh, and so just and he used that salmonella to teach me that 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 he had uh, see I was astounded and this is so dumb but this is just how dumb we are and, um, anyway but when he told Jeff twenty four hours before I was diagnosed with salmonella and I was astounded I said Lord you you knew what it was you knew you knew well of course he knew <laughs> but the fact that he told Jeff what it was. You know, 24 hours, and he told the doctor, and the doctor did, the doctor kind of poo pooed it. He didn't think that's what it was. And they didn't even test me until like five minutes before I walked out of the hospital. So then it was another 24. I didn't get the diagnosis till three o'clock the next day. So what he was showing me, so then I said, Lord, well, Lord, if you knew what it was, isn't that dumb? Of course, he knows what it is. But anyway, but I said, Lord, James, get me a Kleenex. I said, if, if you knew what it was, I said, and that, I know that, that I can't get past how dumb that sounds, but if you knew what it was, why didn't you heal me? And, and then, and so my, my point of faith for healing was here, was this place. They were telling me all this stuff about, um, well, it could be this, it could be that, and I swear, if, if they had said you've got four, stage four colon cancer because my colon was swollen, I, I, it wouldn't have phased me because this is where my faith was. My faith was in the fact that just tell me what it is and I know Jesus will take care of it. That's where my faith was, and and God honored that. So I know had they said you've got stage four colon cancer, I know I would have been healed. But what he was showing me was I, there's a better way because he's already healed us, thank you. He's already healed us. By it, by his stripes we were healed. So he was he was showing me that that had I taken authority over it at the beginning, had I um, had I had I spoken to the mountain to the at the beginning, then I then he would have met me there. Okay, but he met me right where my faith was. And uh, so we simply need to get in the word. And we need to believe it. And that's the problem. We don't, we don't really believe it. You know? And, and somehow, you know, we, it, 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 get, it may be in here, but it doesn't get down to here. And that's what, and I, you know, and I hate that, we're, that we all have to learn, you know, by these hard knocks and experiences. But guess what? I, I've learned more about healing in the last month after that situation than I have for years that I've been trying to get it. You know, and that's just, you know, my stupidity, I guess. But, uh, but anyway, but we need to begin to thank him for the delivering work that he's already done. Because God is faithful to his word. So, you know what? If his word says it, the, the problem is we just really don't believe it. <laughs> and, 
And we got to get in there and say, Lord, I need to believe this. I need, I need your help. I need your revelation knowledge. I need you to help me to really believe this. Just show me how I can believe this. Now, I heard a story about Abraham Lincoln and whether they, and I haven't figured out whether it's true or not, but it's not, it's cool anyway, even if it's not true, because they said they don't know if it's real or not. But anyway, the story goes like this, that Abraham Lincoln went to a slave auction one day and he was appalled at what he saw. And he was drawn to a young woman on the slave uh, auction block. And as the beginning, the bidding began, Abraham Lincoln bid on this woman. And he purchased her. And he said, I'm going to get her no matter the cost. And uh, so after he paid the auctioneer, he walked over to the woman and said, you're free. And she said, free? What, you know, she didn't even know what he was talking about. And, and he, she said, what, what, what does that mean? And he said, it means you're free. And uh, he says, you are completely free. And, um, and does it mean I can do whatever I want to do, she asked. And he said, yes. He said, you're free to do whatever you want to do. And uh, she said, free to say what I want to say? And he said, yes, you're free to say whatever you want to say. And um, does freedom mean um, does freedom mean asking with hope and hesitation that I can go wherever I want to go? It means exactly that you can go wherever you want to go. So with tears of joy and gratitude welling up in her eyes, then she said, "Then I think I'll go with you." Now, this story may or may not be true, but it does illustrate very well what Christ did for us and how our who affects our do. And it illustrates just what God did for us through Jesus because guess what? It cost him everything to free us from that evil taskmaster uh, that that had control over us. And then, what did he do? He freed us. He paid the penalty for us. He got us free. He bought us off the slave block. And then what did he do? He turned around and just set us free, right? He turned. He never overrode our will, and he never will. Just like, just like I, I think I, I know, see, that's a, I know I could have been healed had I resisted it, but no, he met me right where I was. You know, he met me right where I was. So he's never going to override your free will, but his mercy and grace covers you all the time. So uh, let's look at John 3, 36. And it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now notice, if you believe on the Son, you're not appointed to wrath. And if you don't believe on the Son, you are appointed to wrath. Okay, and you'll see that same thing throughout the Bible. And, uh, and then in the Amplified, it says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Who can say amen to that? All right, and amen means let it be so or so be it. Now, could the, could the slave girl point to anything that she did to free herself? I can't think of anything. Can you? And, uh, and she was a slave, and she would have been killed or tortured in the le at least to keep her in line from running, right? There was nothing she could do to free herself, to get herself off of that slave lot. There's, there's absolutely nothing, and this is exactly how we are. We are literally born slaves to sin. And that's why, you know, if you're astounded because somebody's in sin, well, it's just, it's just ridiculous because sinners do what sinners do. And unless you're born again, that's all you know how to do is sin. Because we're born slaves to sin, and only Jesus can set us free. So when the Bible talks about and says uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, that they compared themselves with themselves. It means that we're all in sin, but what we typically do is we look at somebody else and we think, oh, well, I'm better than that person. I did that for years. I compared myself uh, amongst ourselves, okay? I would go to church and I would want to emulate, you know, Sansa, who I thought had it all together, 
All right, but the problem was so and so never did a thing in their lives. You know, from a small child, they, you know, they just were good people and they never did anything. So then I, the devil's beating me up, you know, every day. Well, they've been good since they were born. You know, look, you, well, look what you did, and you can't go back and be a kid again and redo it. You know, so it doesn't pay. It doesn't work to compare yourself with other people. But then what we do is then this is what I would do. I'd find somebody worse than me. <laughs> okay, and then compare myself to them. Okay, well, I'm better than they are because look what they've done and I've never done those things, okay? And uh, so it just is ridiculous to compare yourself. And, uh, and, so, um, and so in truth, um, we're simply looking down the line of uh, the slave block and comparing ourselves to other slaves, right? Because we're all in the same, uh, we're all in the same slave boat, if, uh, so to speak. So, uh, so what I'm actually doing is that, well, I'm just as good as those slaves, right? Or maybe I'm a little better than those slaves, okay? But guess what? We're all slaves. So how stupid to compare ourselves with one another. So that's what uh, Corinthians is telling us not to do. Because we're all slaves, we're all on the slave block of sin, so it does no good to compare yourself uh, to others. And I'll tell you another thing, in the Christian life, we're on different levels, okay? Every day that I live, I'm learning more and more and more. The Lord's showing me more and more and more uh, that I'm able to share with y'all and tell you what the Lord has shown me. But you know what? We're all on different levels. It's like kind of being in school. Okay, I may be in the 10th grade and you may be in the 6th grade. There's nothing wrong with that. So we shouldn't compare ourselves. What we need to do is try to, try to work hard, learn as much as we can so we can get to the 10th grade, so we can get to the 12th grade, so we can get to college, right? And so it's, it's not that anybody's, you know, worse off than anybody else. We're just on different levels of understanding. And um, we don't have anything to point to to say... You know, this is why I should not be on the slave block, do we? Can you come to God and say, well, God, you, you better deliver me because. Well, I don't have anything. Do you? Okay, all I have is guilt and condemnation. So there's nothing I have to say. You better buy me off this slave block because, because. I don't have a because. And uh, so we don't have anything to point to to say, God, th this is why you should heal me. Or this is why you should bless me. Or this is why you should do whatever. No, we don't have anything. Just like that girl had nothing that she could say to Abraham Lincoln, well, this is why you should buy me off this slave block. See, we only have him to point to, and we can only receive based on what he did for us, buying us off the slave block of sin and then setting us free. And he did it out of just pure love for us. And then what, then what we do in return, see, when you get your who right, your do gets right. Because you'll be so in love with him, so appreciative of him, that just like that slave girl, I want to go with you. I want to go live with you. You're awesome. I want to go be with you. And so that's why I always say, when my, my do wasn't right until I got my who right. And when I realized that day who I was in Christ and what he really did for me, my, my dude just turned all the way around. My whole life just, just flipped over and did a, did a 180. And uh, because then I wasn't, see, before I was serving out of duty. I was going to church, reading my Bible, having regular prayer time. I was doing all that to, to earn from God because I thought I had to do these things to get God to respond to me. And then when I realized actually what Jesus did, see, it wasn't anything I can do. It's what he did. And then guess what? Because he did that, now I want to do. <laughs> so instead of doing it out of obligation, now I'm doing it out of pure love. I want to go with you. I want to learn more about you. I want to spend time with you. Because why? Because you did this for me. And now I love you because of what you did for me. And so I think I'll, I think I'll go, go on with Jesus. And notice how every single religion, except for biblical Christianity, teaches you what you have to do, right? The Muslims, that's why they're killing Christians, that's why they're killing Jews, because that, they think their do uh, guarantees them a place in heaven. 
What do Jehovah Witnesses do? They go knocking on doors because they see there's only 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses that are going to make it to heaven. So you got to earn your way. So you got to knock on enough doors so you can get there, right? And uh, and the more, uh, more Mormons too. And so mainstream Christianity uh, even believes this lie. I believed it that that I had to do you know certain things. I tell you, there was a time when the kids were little that I worked myself to death in church. You know, I mean, I really got to, because we homeschooled, and then I, I, did every, I did everything there was to do that I could possibly volunteer for at church. And it got to be, you know, exhausting. I was wearing myself out and, um, because I was trying to earn favor with God. And again, there's just absolutely nothing, you know, that you can do to get yourself off the slave walk. It's just out of his love and mercy that, that he gets us off. And uh, that woman on the slave walk, she was condemned. And, and that's why we feel uh, condemned, because we know we're sinners, right? Nobody had to tell me I was a sinner. I knew that. And, uh, and, and then we justify ourselves by comparing ourselves with others, which is absolutely ridiculous. So I saw recently, and you might have seen it too, a, a little video on uh, Palestinian youth camps. And it was so sad. I mean, this little boy, like 8 or 10 years old, he was just a little guy, and he was praising Hitler, okay, in this video. And, uh, and instead of going to, you know, a Bible church camp or uh, VBS or something, they go to these uh, military camps, these little tiny kids, and they teach them, uh, to reverence Hitler and they teach them to kill Israelites and Jews and Christians and uh, it's absolutely heartbreaking and I saw another video of where this little three-year-old had a teddy bear and a fake knife and he was stabbing the teddy bear and he was you know uh, they're teaching that that that's a Jew you know that, that's what they teach them these little children from from the time they're born they, I mean can you imagine giving birth to a son and you think that that he's um, going to be a martyr, that he's going to one day, you know, in his early 20s, he's going to die for Allah. I mean, that, 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 that's what they think, you know. And, uh, and so that's what they train him for. The, I mean, can you imagine as a mother raising your child to die for Allah? It, it's so bad. It's so sad. It's so perverted. And guess what? They're doing that in the name of religion. You know, that's what religion teaches you. And, uh, but see, what we know to be the truth is that Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us. He died for them. And, uh, and so all we have to do is turn around and call, and call on him, and then we'll be saved. And um, so, so that's what Paul is telling us, that, that he said that God did not give us the law like these other religions all have some kind of law to keep, right? God did not give us these laws like other religions so that we could earn our way because can you earn your way? No, it's absolutely impossible. And so he gave the law to show us that we couldn't keep it, that we couldn't get ourselves off the slave walk. And so, um, so that's why the blood sacrifices of the animals were required because only the blood of the lamb could buy us back from sin. And so if keeping the law could have been done, there would have been no need for the animal sacrifices, right? And uh, just go back to Adam and Eve. You know, after they sinned, God uh, uh, slayed an animal to cover them, with cover their sin, to cover their nakedness. You know, and of course, I believe that they were covered in a, a robe of light, you know, glory light. The, the Bible says that's what God is. God is clothed in light. And I believe that's what Adam and Eve were clothed in. And that's why they were found naked. But that's just my personal thing. But, um, but um, he had to, that sin is so awful, he had to shed this animal, uh, kill this animal to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin. And so... But see, what, what do we do today? Well, and, and I'm an animal lover, but everybody's an animal lover, right? So, so and, and I've even seen this in the kids in children's church. If you start talking about anything that has to do with killing an animal, uh, they totally reject that. Okay, well, you're rejecting God. Okay, because this was God, this is how God deals with sin. 
So if you're so opposed, if you're so into animals that you love animals more than you love God, then there's a problem. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and God made the animals. But, uh, but see, those animals, see, if that animal didn't die, you would die. <laughs> that animal took your place. So if you love animals so much, then you lay down and you die. I mean, that's basically what it amounts to. And so, um, so we got to, you know, be careful about this, you know, animal love thing. And uh, I told Jeff the other day, I said, oh, my gosh, we are those people, you know, taking our dog with us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I did. I said, we're that old, that old couple, you know, with our kids gone and we carry our dog everywhere. So, so embarrassing. <laughs> I don't want to be that person. <laughs> She bit me last night. <laughs> yeah, she did. Her, uh, she had a big mat, you know, and I tried to, I put some conditioner on it, and I was trying to pick it out with the hair pick, and she turned around and bit me. Oh, no. But I did. I spanked her hard, and she wept. And then after that, she didn't like it, but she let me do it. But, uh, yeah, she's something else. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so, you know what, to me this is just, this, this animal love thing is just, uh, I think, and, and don't get me wrong, because we need to love animals, not love animals, we need to take care of animals, they're God's creatures, blah, blah, blah. So that's not what I'm saying. But we have taken it so far to the, to the you know, falling off into this ditch, okay, that, that we are elevating animals to a point of, of people. Okay, and and th and therefore so much so that the children, when they're being taught about uh, the Old Testament, they're rejecting it because of this animal love. Okay, I hope y'all get what I'm saying. Because sin was was uh, serious, and and what Satan is doing is he's making us pansies, right? He's making us pansies about about everything. And, um, and he doesn't want us to, to have anything or focus on or even think about any blood that was shed from an animal, okay? And that animal's blood, again, was shed for that person. So it was either that person or it was the animal, all right? And so, and that all pointed to what Jesus did, okay? Jesus took, he was that slain lamb. He was that lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. God knew how it was all going to go down. And in truth, and now, like, like the Holy Spirit showed Jeff that the animals were never tortured. They were never beaten. They were never, they were, they were uh, killed in a, you know, a, a humane way. But Jesus was tortured beyond recognition. And they said that movie, you know, uh, um, what's the name of the Passion of the Christ. They said, I mean, it, it, it can't even compare to what really happened. That the Bible says that he was literally unrecognizable. And I watched a documentary on that movie, and they said, you know, had they made it really in keeping, you know, more with the what the Bible says, that, that, that I mean, it would have been an X-rated movie. They wouldn't have been able to show it. Then. Anyway, but uh, see, that's what we need to understand what the animal sacrifices were for. We need to understand the seriousness of them, and we need to understand that what he went through. Um, so that we could uh, live. And then when you understand that, your do is just going to come along with your who. Okay? Your doing is just going to, you're, you're, you are going to do things just because you love him. I want to go with you, Jesus. I want to go with you, Mr. Lincoln. You loved me enough to buy me and then set me free. I want to go with you. And that's what you'll do with Jesus. And, uh, and, and I'm telling you, I struggled for years, okay, because I didn't understand what Jesus did. And, and, and still with healing, uh, Jennifer knows, I told her, I just can't get it. I, I want to believe for healing. I've been healed. I teach healing. But somehow I just couldn't get it. And uh, through this Salmonella thing, he's taught me more about healing in the last month than I've, than I've had in my whole entire life. And, uh, and this is why the gospel is called the gospel. What's the gospel? It's called the good news. It's good news. And uh, it's the good news because he bought us off the slave block of sin. And when you get this revelation, it's just unbelievable. 
And it's not of this world. This world cannot understand it. Your friends won't understand it. People who are unsaved cannot understand it because they're still on the slave block and you've been bought off and you've been set free. So it's nothing to do with your do. It's all about what he's done. And what he's showing me is that, yeah, he saved us from sin, but guess what? He healed our bodies. He provided for us financially. Whatever. Notice Adam and Eve were created on the on the sixth day, okay? So all everything they had need of was prepared the days before that. Their food, they had no need. So they came last because God wants us to, uh, he's already provided everything that we need. But the problem is we just don't believe it. And we read it, but we really don't take it to heart because we really don't believe it. And just like I did, the, I'm telling you, the Lord spoke to me clear as a bell. I heard it, what he said two years ago, that this was going to happen. And I reasoned my way out of it because it didn't happen when I thought it was going to happen in the time frame that I thought it was going to happen. So I reasoned my way out of it. Isn't that what we do? Well, well, maybe, what if? You know, so I'm challenging you to read the word and take it seriously. And in closing, this goes so much further than we think. And, it, and uh, this, um, what we're learning in Romans, and it's just going to get more exciting. And I hope you're going to get excited about it. And uh, because, because what Paul is doing is he's unrolling truth like a carpet. Every chapter, he's just unrolling the carpet a little further. And you're going to get more and more excited, I hope, as you see how he's unrolling this. And, and literally what he's telling you is, uh, is you've got to get out of your thinking that you can do anything to earn God's grace or earn his salvation or earn his provision or anything. And you got to get it out of your thinking that you can do anything to move God. If you have a need in your life, oh, well, God, okay, God, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I'm on time for church. I'm going to make sure I'm there uh, three times a week. I'm going to make it. No, all that's your do. See, if you're doing so you can get God to answer your prayers, he's not going to honor that. That's like you laying on the altar. And that's like you being killed, you know, for your sins. No, he won't honor that. He says, I'm only going to honor one sacrifice, and that's Jesus' sacrifice. And so there's nothing you can do to earn uh, anything. And what, what did we read in the beginning? He said that it's by faith. It's by faith that you are saved. It's by faith that your finances are provided. It's by faith that your body is healed. It's by faith that your, uh, that your um, um, children are healed. It, you cannot buy God's anything. It's all by faith. And that's what, that's what those opening scriptures were about. So I have to stop, and I hope that you got something out of that, and I hope you're getting excited about about your who because it's all about your who and not about your do and I borrowed that from Joyce Meyer but I think it is so apropos and it just will change your life when you get that I was thinking yesterday if somebody had told me the truth when I was in my 20s or even in my teens and maybe they did and I didn't get it so I'm not, I'm not saying but I didn't get it and I'm not sure if anybody told me or not but if somebody had told me what I know now, my whole life would have been different, okay? Because uh, I just had, I just had, my theology was just all screwed up, <laughs> okay? And I went to a Christian high school, and, uh, and uh, you know, we've been in the Church of God since, you know, our early 20s, and uh, I still screwed up. And uh, I thought it was all about my due, you know? And, of course, we were taught that, you know, you can't, uh, you know, I told you last week they got on to Jeff about having a beard and, they, the women would just come down on me, you know, to a point where I literally quit wearing pants. I only wore dresses. I didn't wear makeup, and I don't look good without makeup. And uh, uh, and so, um, you know, and all that. And guess what? See, that caused a problem with Jeff because now he married one thing, and now I'm looking like another thing, you know, and, and he didn't like that. Okay, so now I got a problem with the church and my husband. You know, now what do I do? 
know. So it just caused all kinds of problems. And it was, it, it's just, and they were good people, and they were, but guess what? They were all about the law. See, they thought that if I didn't wear pants, that I'm going to be right with God. Well, no. When he, when he says women are not supposed to put on men's clothing, he's not talking about wearing pants. He's talking about me being a tra uh, transgender and, and dressing like a man and trying to be a man and look like a man. That's what he's talking about. And uh, but, but anyway, so it's not about your who, uh, your do. It's all about your who. Just get, get it in your head that you're on a slave block of sin and Jesus bought you off. And now you are free to go love him and serve him. And then in return, guess what he's going to do? He's just going to take care of you. Whatever you need, he'll take care of it. You just believe by faith that, that he's going to do it. That's how it works. And that's what Paul is saying. So join us upstairs at 1115-ish for praise and worship. And praise him and get into it because he, he did so much for you. And buying you off that slave block. So let's give him our praise this morning, okay? All right, love y'all. Thanks for coming.